So hello, everybody, and welcome to our Perio Microconference on Open Source Governance by Example. Um, thank you for joining us today. And today's session, as I mentioned, will be recorded, and the recording link will be sent out to attendees um, afterward once we have it up on the Aperio YouTube channel. So you can catch it there, uh, forward it to your friends, that sort of thing. Um, my name is Wilma Hodges, and I'll be moderating today's session. So if you have any questions during the presentation, please do enter those into the chat and our speaker will address them at the end of the session. Uh, but go ahead and get them entered so you don't so lose the thread um, during the, the actual presentation. So today it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, VM Brasor, or VM or Vicky, um, is an award-winning free open source advocate and corporate strategist, international keynote speaker and writer. She is the author of Forge Your Future with Open Source and Business Success with Open Source, both, pub, uh, both published by Pragmatic Bookshelf. Aside from articles in various publications, she also writes about free and open source software, business, and their intersection on her blog. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Vicki, and she's going to talk about open source governance. Yay! Hey there, folks, um, and thank you so much, Wilma. Okay, now I can either see big blue button or I can see my slides. So if you'll apologize, uh, pardon me, I'm going to do my slides. Now, all right, hi. Hello, everyone, thank you for being here. Um, as Wilma said, today we will be learning about governance with respect to free and open source projects, but um, I want to reiterate something that she just covered, which is please add questions to the chat. Um, as I just said, I can't really see anything except my slides right now. Um, also, every project is different um, with unique community and similarly unique constraints and needs. And so therefore, the content of this talk is intentionally high level. I have saved a lot of time at the end to address your specific questions, which is why it's very important that you put them in the chat, because uh, I really think those questions are going to be the most valuable part of this uh, session for everyone. So drop them into the chat. I'll get them to get to them at the end. So um, and before I get started, huge thanks to Wilma, uh, not only for the the introduction, but for wrangling these questions, because I know sometimes that can be a royal pain in the butt. So cheers. Yay, Wilma. All right. Let's get started with the actual content here. Uh, I'm going to start with a question, a fairly fundamental question for this session, which is what even is governance? Now, you probably already have some ideas about the answers of this, um, or maybe you don't, but I will define it so we are all on the same page. And that definition is going to start with some formal ones, some formal definitions. A uh, quick note for the following and other slides within this presentation, I will be reading the contents for our visually impaired audience members. So first formal definition is from the Governance Institute. What would they know about governance? Um, so the Governance Institute defines governance as Governance encompasses the system by which an organization is controlled and operates, and the mechanisms by which it and its people are held to account. Ethics, risk management, compliance, and administration are all elements of governance. See, I told you they were formal definitions. Um, our next one comes from everybody's favorite online encyclopedia, Wikipedia who says that governance is the process of making and enforcing decisions within an organization or society. It encompasses decision making, rule setting, and enforcement mechanisms to guide the functioning of an organization or society. All right, again, formal and fairly repetitive with that organization or society, but hey, I'll take my editor hat off right now. Um, our third one is a bit shorter. The act or process of governing or overseeing the control and direction of something, that is the definition from Merriam-Webster. Now, obviously, each of these definitions is accurate, but they're not catchy and they're kind of hard to remember. Um, 
I prefer to define governance, especially in the context of free and open source software as infrastructure for humans. That's it. It's those bits that allow us as human beings to function and interoperate smoothly. It is the how and the why we do things here. And I'm going to return to those two words, how and why, multiple times throughout this presentation because they are absolutely key to governance, both of them together, like chocolate and peanut butter. Now, this is a broad definition. Um, governance is infrastructure for humans, and that is intentional. Um, because the infrastructure required varies depending upon the group of humans involved. They have different needs, different constraints, things like that. Now, on this slide, we see a few very high level examples of some of the things that could be in human infrastructure for a free and open source software project. There's conflict management and decision making methods. Um, how do you come up with leaders, that sort of thing. Codes of ethic and conduct are important elements of uh, human infrastructure. Contribution procedures, how do people give their time, their talent, their treasure to your free and open source software project. Project roadmaps help to keep everybody pulling in the same direction. Um, and intellectual property policies, such as contributor licensing agreements, uh, developer certificate of origin, trademark policies, things like that. Now, these are all things which, when defined, set up expectations for that how and why we do things here. Because free and open source software, it is by people, for people, and of people. It's made out of people, not code. The code is very important, of course, obviously. But without the people, you got nothing. And all of those people, they're going to collaborate better when they share an understanding of the rules of engagement within a community. We need that shared understanding as well as the expectations that come with that understanding. And this makes free and open source software governance a vital part of any project. Without that shared understanding, you have no community, no collaboration, nothing to hold together the source code, the documentation, the technical infrastructure part of it. You don't have that human part that makes free and open source software truly special without governance. Now, despite how critical governance is to the functioning of FOSS projects and communities, there's still a lot of problems that are worryingly common. While governance itself is difficult to generalize, the problems tend to fall into a number of buckets. Not the least of which is that governance rarely bubbles up to the top of the awareness of many free and open source software maintainers. They just don't think about governance at all. It does not hit register on their radar. Now, over the past several decades of free and open source software, we have unfortunately created a culture that often prioritizes code over pretty much anything else. Um, a secondary concern may be licensing, but frankly, I think while it's important, it is similarly undeserving of the level of fixation it has. And that has led us to a time now where we're trying to unravel this tangle of priority of code over everything else. So because of that, the human infrastructure never enters the mind of many open source project maintainers. But if it does, it's often dismissed as something that just doesn't require additional attention. We don't need governance. It's just so obvious how things work, isn't it? I mean, people can go and learn how it's done like I did. I suffered, so they should suffer. I'm not going to make things easy for them because I had it the hard way without any governance documentation whatsoever. And look at how I turned out. Um, as you can probably tell from my snarky tone, uh, this bootstrapping I suffered and everyone else should sort of uh, sort of attitude. It's 
it's negative. It drives people away from open source. It's an anti-pattern. But it's one that we find over and over again in free and open source software projects and communities. The thing is, if you don't tell people how to do things, if you don't give them that documented governance, people are going to make their own. And you might not like it, but they got to because they're trying to get stuff done here. And if you're not giving them guidance, they're going to find their own way. So governance is absolutely required to help people move in the same direction. It's not people's faults if they show up to a project, try to contribute and do it in a way that is different from what you expect if you don't establish expectations first. And a dirty little secret of all those, oh, we don't need no stinking governance type projects is that, hey, yo, you got governance there. Whether they admit it or not, they have some sort of governance. They have that here's how and why we do things here. They just haven't really written it down. Even single person projects have that how I do things here sort of processes and policies. Now, as academics, you can think about your own projects, your individual projects. They don't have to be open source, but they also have governance, whether you've documented it or not. You know, data must go in this location and be in that format. Have you written it down? Maybe not, but that's governance. You know, you shouldn't share certain data. You know, you shouldn't publish without review. These are all elements of governance within your project. The governance is there. It's just not acknowledged. And a lot of projects are in denial about the governance that exists within their project already. And they claim policies and procedures are just corporate. They're, they're overhead that we just don't need in this project. And they say that without recognizing that the lack of policies and procedures is also overhead. And usually it's a heck of a lot more and it can hold the project back. So not having things documented really holds back a lot of projects, not acknowledging the existing boots on the ground, this is how we do things here, processes that are already there. Um, but fundamentally, most maintainers, they're really good people and they really want to do the right thing. They just don't know how. This governance stuff is hard, full stop. Um, it's hard to choose what to talk about, what to think about. It's hard to document it. It's hard to maintain it because this is human infrastructure stuff. And I don't know whether you've noticed, but we human beings, we are squishy, difficult things. We're hard to get a good handle on sometimes. Therefore, defining anything related to getting humans to interoperate is similarly squishy and difficult. But that's okay, right? Because there is a lot of valuable and worthwhile things out there in this world that are difficult, and we still do them, like free and open source software. As with so many worthwhile things, the best way to start is to start at all. Baby steps are still steps. Um, so just acknowledging what uh, that governance is important and starting to apply your mind in some way, that's the first step. And that's often the hardest step for a lot of free and open source software projects. Um, it can therefore be really helpful to give people some guidance, some guardrails, for how to approach our, uh, governance for the first time. So where can they start? If nothing else, if they are completely stymied, there are five questions that are the most critical, I think, to the governance of any free and open source software project. What is the purpose or mission of the project? Why is it here? What's, what's, what is it trying to accomplish, right? That's important. Who is leading the project? If you're the founder of the project and therefore you say, I founded this, I get to make all these decisions, that's great. Just be open about it. Write it down, tell people. If that's not the case, or even if it is, how is leadership chosen, right? 
Is it because you founded the project? Is it because you were uh, nominated by community members? Is there a voting process? I don't know, but write that down. Figure it out and let people know. Is there a code of conduct? And if there is, what does it contain? If there isn't, don't ignore it, own it. Document that we intentionally do not have a code of conduct because X, Y, Z. Now, I think you're wrong if you don't have a code of conduct, but that is, of course, your choice um, not to have one. If you do have a code of conduct, how is it enforced? Um, be really transparent about that sort of stuff because it makes a difference when you do need to start enforcing it. And it sets up expectations within the community so they know what to do and what to expect should somebody transgress the norms of that free and open source software project. Now, unless it is a one person community or project and you're flying solo 100%, don't answer these questions alone. Involve the community. Also, it's a pretty short list, it's only five. Oh, it's only five questions, but they're complex questions, right? These are really meaning of life type stuff with regards to the free and open source software project you're, you're looking at. Um, so take the time, take some real time with your community to discuss the answers. And as you're discussing it and you're coming up with those answers, document them and make sure people can find it. Document it within the project itself. So if somebody were able or if somebody came along and cloned your project to their own uh, server or whatever, the documentation, the governance, it travels with it. So they always know where to find the documentation. Um, now these questions are a good place to start. They're obviously not the only things you could discuss. Um, you also could contribute things like how people contribute, what's that process. If they do contribute, how do you approve to merge it into your, pro into your project? Um, how do you want people to report bugs? or features or ask questions or any of that sort of stuff. Um, I guarantee you have opinions on this. Write them down. Can somebody join a core team of con uh, contributors? If they can, how do they do that? Be transparent to make it really clear to people that, yes, I can reach that goal. I can become a core contributor. Here's the documentation on how. Does the project hold meetings? How many meetings? Who runs them? How, where are they? Held, um, how do you take notes? Do you take notes? Where do you log them? That sort of things. Um, does the project get money, donations from things like oh, GitHub sponsors or Open Collective or Tidelift or any of those? Well, what's the deal with that? Where's the money go? Um, do you need to get audited? Document that sort of stuff so people can see you're really above board. And ethically speaking, your project has got its ducks in a row. And very importantly, I find, how does a project recognize non-code contributions? Now, these are just a few ideas, and they might not even apply to your project. Uh, but it's not an exhaustive list. There are so many other things that you could consider for governance within your project, because FOSS governance, again, is the how and why we do things here. So any sort of policy and procedure that helps to support and build and strengthen that human infrastructure can qualify as governance documents. How you interpret that, it's up to you. I cho choose to interpret it fairly broadly again, um, but interpreting it broadly for better or worse can lead to a whole lot of options of things to document. That is a lot of work. Um, and it's good to have all of these options and all of these things that you're documenting because the more transparent the project is with the people that are coming to use it, that are coming to contribute to it, the better. If nothing else though, always, always start by documenting what already exists. Look at how you and the community approach the project today, now, what are the tasks you have to perform while working on that project? List them out. Start to write out even an outline form. Here's how we do things here. How do we prefer that these tasks be done? How do we prefer people review 
pull requests? How do we prefer people format their code, right? Make those unwritten rules written. It makes a big difference. While you're doing that, you undoubtedly will come up with other ideas for other things you'd like to define better, and that also is great. Write an issue. Make it clear and public that this is something we're thinking about, and we will get here. And if you have thoughts, add them to the issue. And when we have time, we're going to get around to actually documenting that. Once you have done all this, you can look at what you have. Here's all the stuff we've already collected and look at it all. There's so much because human infrastructure, it's complex. Look at it and see whether it's where you want things to be. If not, revise and iterate and iterate. Now you're working on this and you come up with this list of things that you probably should have and don't have yet, or even things you do have and you think are really lacking. You're like, wow, this kind of sucks. There is so much work to be done here, and I just don't have the time to build all of this from scratch. And What the heck am I supposed to do? Well, what you do is you find an easier way to do it because this is open source, right? This is the FOSS way. We, we build on the shoulders of giants. We learn from and we build upon the work of those who came before us. And it's one of the magical parts of free and open source software. And that way I like to compare it to science where scientists of tomorrow are learning and building upon the work of scientists of today. Open source is the same way. So as you're working on governance, you can learn an immense amount from looking at the governance documents of the projects that came before you. A lot of these, pro these documents, these governance documents, they're also licensed in such a way that you can take them and you can modify them and you can reuse them with appropriate attribution, right? You can do that and you don't have to build everything from scratch. It's brilliant. Now, usually this requires a great deal of web searching and it's kind of irritating. Um, I say this as somebody who has done this so many times throughout my career and it does get irritating and it got to the point where I was like well heck with this there has to be a better way and if there isn't I'm going to build it so that better way is called the FOSS governance collection and you can find it at fossgovernance.org this is a project that provides exactly what it says on the tin it's a collection of governance documents from FOSS projects and foundations everywhere all over the place this collection really increases the discoverability of FOSS government uh, governance documents from anywhere you can find it and it makes your life so much easier because it's all right there quick and easy not only is it quick and easy it's cataloged it's archived and it is full text searchable which makes life so much nicer all of this is thanks to the project using the superb Zotero free software project. Now I'm speaking to an academic audience, so you probably already are familiar with Zotero. If not, look it up. It's brilliant. It is a citation and research tool, um, and yet it works perfectly here. It does exactly what I need without having to, again, rebuild or reinvent the wheel. Um, and because it is a Zotero group library, you can use it with the Zotero desktop application on your, your laptop or server. Um, you can even use it offline if you want because it's Zotero and it's brilliant that way. So um, let's see. Can we do a live demo? I don't know. Let's see whether it works. Um, let me see. Do, 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 do. And look at that. Actually, we'll go over here first. Here is the FOSS Governance Collection homepage. It's nothing really shiny, but it is highly functional. So that's great. Um, so it doesn't have a lot here. It's got documentation, code of conduct, where to find the source code. Um, the place you are more likely to go is down here to visit the collection. When you click on that, you will be taken to the Zotero. Hang on, make it readable for everyone. 
Now, at the moment, this is, oh dear, I've got all these pop-ups on my screen. Go away. Um, so right now, there are 359 uh, separate documents in this uh, collection. It is constantly growing. It is constantly evolving. Um, it is separated into different categories. So for-profit projects, nonprofit organizations, and specific discrete free and open source software projects. Um, let me see. It, uh, the way I normally navigate it, because this is the way my brain is wired, is the tagging. Um, let's say I am working with a free and open source software project and we discover that, oh dear, we need a privacy policy because people are coming to our website and we, we need that sort of stuff. Um, who has done privacy policies before? What can I crib and use myself? Well, I'll go over here. Yes, you can see that. Um, go over here to Oversight Committee, no. Patents, no, I'm not dealing with that right now. Privacy policy, ah, perfect. Click that. And I can see that at the moment, there are seven privacy policies in the collection. That's a heck of a good start. I can at least see what Drupal and Discourse and Debian have all done for their privacy policies. I can then build my own, give it to my lawyers for a review. They can go, yes, that's super, and then go on our way, rather than having my lawyer have to do it from scratch. Um, if you're familiar with Zotero, you can, uh, you probably know this already, but if not, you can click privacy of policy again, and it goes back to all of them. Um, as I mentioned, it is fully uh, full text searchable, if you would like. Um, let's go up here, uh, working with a project where have, Actually, I am working with a new project soon, um, and we're going to start elections uh, next year. Just um, the Open Source Robotics Association. Um, I'm their governance, uh, their open governance advisor, uh, and we just launched last month. Super exciting! At the moment, our uh, technical steering committee is uh, handpicked by by the CTO. Next year, it will probably evolve into something more election style. Like, how do you vote, right? What are the voting procedures that pro projects use? Let's look them up. This will take a while because it is full text. There we go. There are 21 items that mention voting, which is super helpful. Um, so I can have a look at how RD Pilot does it, or Mobi, or SPDX. All right. And that's really helpful for me to be able to see how other people have done their their voting in the past. Click. Um, if you click on any specific document, go to Django Community Diversity Statement. Let's do that. They're very good at community diversity. Go Django. Um, you can see when it was captured, the original URL, so you can go to find that. Also, um, you see right here, these little links. This document has been um, snapshotted and archived. So you can see the precise version that is uh, cataloged here. Um, if it evolves, eventually there will be another version that will be in here. But at the moment, there's only one for the diversity statement. Um, so let me see, that is the quick and dirty walkthrough of the FOSS governance collection, which is super duper helpful. Um, it has saved me hours. It's also lost me hours because I am the primary maintainer right now of the FOSS governance collection. Um, however, as of yesterday, I think I might have a co-maintainer, which is super exciting. Um, so quick tour, as I said, it is constantly growing as things are added and cataloged. The two things that require the most time, frankly, are finding the documents, doing the searches for them, and then cataloging them. Um, and that's why I don't have too many additional contri contributors right now, because the cataloging is something that at the moment is in my head. It's undocumented, it's an unwritten rule, and that is some governance that I am working on after I 
finish my second book. Um, so if people want to help as you come across governance documents or heck, as you write them yourself, you can contribute them to the project and get them added to the collection. You can just open an issue, um, fosgovernance.org slash contribute will tell you how. You will need a GitLab account, but most of you probably have that of some variety. Um, and the instructions are all on this website. Now I did say we were going to leave a lot of time so I can address your your specific questions about governance. And again, that's gonna be the most valuable part here, so bring on the questions. Um, so I'm gonna tie it off right there. Uh, I am the Ambersor, corporate strategist, open source leader. I am the author of these two books, Forge Your Future with Open Source, which is the first and only book about how to contribute to open source projects. Uh, the second book is Business Success with Open Source, which is in early release right now, and it is almost done. Yay. Um, so it's an early release, and it, uh, it covers how businesses and other organizations, um, academic and otherwise, can use, contribute to, and release free and open source software in strategic ways that are good for the bottom line and the organization strategy, and also good for the community. Um, so uh, these slides are available right now on Internet Archive at archive.org slash details slash Aperio 2024 dash governance by example, all one word. You can find me here at Mastodon at theambersore at social.theambersore.com. Um, email, you want to email me, feel free, please do. Um, Aperio 2024 at theambersore.com. And my books, please have a look at them. Fossbooks.com is where you can find them. Um, huge thanks to Patrick, to Wilma, to the entire team for having me. Thanks to you for being here. Um, now, uh, I shall jump back to the chat uh, and see what questions we have, and hopefully not comments disguised as questions. <laughs> Actually, yeah. the chat has been pretty quiet. But I do have a few Goodness. conversation starters that Patrick left me with. So while people are thinking of their um, questions that they would like to ask, um, oh, you can go ahead and, and kind of get things rolling a little bit. Um, so Vicki, can you share any tips um, when a project resides in or maybe could be accountable to multiple organizations? For example, it's a faculty researcher working within a university and the desires of those outside the university might conflict with other authorities. Okay, um, so this is actually something I come across. I tend to be in the corporate space a lot, um, and I'm usually employed by some big company and working with uh, uh, open source projects outside of it, either ones that they release or that they are otherwise participating in. And you frequently come get this kind of tension, right? Uh, what's good for the company is not necessarily good for the open source project. And that's a really difficult situation, frankly. Um, a lot of it comes down to the controlling factor or the controlling body of it. If it is a company project where it is, um, the release style is one where the company maintains all control, then they get to be the tiebreaker and they get to do whatever they want, uh, community be damned, which is a shame. And usually there are ways to approach that, but those ways will be fairly specific to the point of tension and the, um, the community in question. If it is a community governed project, then the community is the one that gets to make the decision. Regardless on either side, Everyone has to be heard. This is your standard sort of conflict, uh, conflict mm, resolving um, process. Listen to everyone. Make sure they know they are being heard and take their, their concerns into account. When you come to your decision, own it. Say, we made this decision, not, you know, this decision was made. Be very active. We made this decision for these reasons. Your reasons were good, but this is it. This is why this overrules. We 
this is controlled by the university. The university has rules that say this. I'm sorry, but we have to follow the university's rules. But here's how we are going to try to mitigate your concerns as much as possible. Um, well, we have a new question. Uh, I don't know, Wilma, was that, did that address the question or not? Yes, I think so. Thank you. Um, yes, and we do have a new question from Ben in the chat. Um, I'll go ahead and read it off for you. If you've built up a community before you've documented the governance, what's the best way to get consensus on what people think the governance is? Because not everyone might have the same understanding. Yes, absolutely. That's where we're going to go back to document what you have now. Um, and the first step in documenting anything is to come up with the subject matter. The subject matter of this talk is governance. And then the details are something that have to be hammered out as you go through the process. Well, as you're looking at your governance, look at, uh, for a community that already exists, look at how you're doing things now and just like high level bullet points. Um, we accept contributions. We make decisions about roadmap. We do just super high level and then talk to people and get their input. What do you think this is? What do you think this is? What do you think this is? And then you can synthesize those. Sometimes they'll overlap, sometimes they won't. And that really helps to show also um, the amount of overlap or lack thereof can help to show uh, either the strength or the weaknesses in communication throughout your project. And that is another thing that you can write down. It's like, okay, well, we're up nowhere close to the same page. This means we've got a problem, a bug in our human infrastructure. Our communication is a problem. Write an issue about that. Fix communication for these reasons. Here are the, here's what I expected. Everybody would be on the same page. Here's a behavior I actually saw. Wow, asked five people and got 10 different answers. Right, um, but do, High level bullet points, this is the steps, and then here's the details for each step. Hammer those out with your pro with your team. Um, I don't know whether that answers your question, Ben. Um, since I know Ben, I know, okay, thanks. Um, I know he's already done this before and he's really quite skilled at it. So um, it's wonderful to have him here, he has his, Itself, a fabulous book all about program management for open source, which goes into a great deal of governance stuff, actually. So uh, if you want to learn a lot of governance and how that human infrastructure works for open source projects, go and look at Ben's book. It's also conveniently listed at fossbooks.com. Uh, let me see. Somebody okay, else. Well, while we're waiting typing. for some other questions, um, I actually have one of my own. Um, just because it's kind of familiar. <laughs> I'm just curious in your experience, um, how common is the benevolent dictator role in free and open source? And is that a good thing, a bad thing, or just a thing? Oh, so how common is benevolent dictator for life? Um, for those who don't know what it is, it is essentially that I am the founder and my word is law. And I there is no way to get that founder out of office, so to speak, to vote them out of office. They're just there. They're at the top of the pyramid and they're going to stay there. Um, how common is it? That's actually a, a difficult question because the overwhelming majority of free and open source software projects have just a tiny number of people working on them. Um, and therefore, yeah, you're going to get a lot of BDFLs out there because there's just no need for anything other than the founder of the project to be the leader and guiding it through. Um, so there are a lot of them. Um, as larger projects, as they get larger and evolve, the, the BDFLs become less and less common because that is part of evolution and growth is acknowledging that our current leadership structure doesn't, doesn't do it anymore. We have uh, either that person is a bottleneck or they just aren't able to scale in the way that we need. They don't have the vision we need. We need uh, to make sure other people's perspectives are heard and considered in these decision making. So that is part of the evolution and growth 
of an open source project. And so BDF belts are less and less common. Um, unfortunately, you also get that situation where you've got that uh, benevolent dictator for life and they kind of whack off that benevolent word and you get the dictator for life. Um, and they just will not give up power whatsoever. It might be a tiny little empire, but by gum, it's mine. And you can't pry it out of my cold, dead hands. That's a huge problem. Um, because you don't necessarily have somebody who is taking the project in the right direction, in the way that allows it to grow, that allows the community to grow, that really allows everyone else to be heard and contribute at a great level. Um, Thankfully, with free and open source software, we have the um, we have the ability to fork projects. And so if you are in a situation where you have a benevolent dictator for life who becomes less and less benevolent over time, if working with them and negotiating with them and communicating with them, just you keep hitting the wall and they're not going to change and they're not going to release their talons from the project you fork it. You create an entirely new project and you use the governance mistakes that you have seen in the past in the original project as a springboard to build a healthier, more transparent, more inclusive governance going forward. And ideally, you want to avoid that, if at all possible. Um, but it's not like a, a company where you can have a CEO at the very start of a company's existence, and as it grows, it grows beyond the capability of the CEO to function and to lead that company well. In that sort of situation, you've got the board of directors who can pull out the great big hook and pull the CEO off stage and put a new one in place. You don't get that for open source. But we do have the fork instead of the hook, and that can be helpful. If you get there, that's kind of the nuclear option, though. All right. While Tilo uh, is thinking, I do have another um, item from Patrick. He asks, uh, when should projects or creators start thinking about governance? And are there techniques or triggers for reflecting on and possibly refactoring governance? Ooh, two questions. Um, when should they start thinking about governance? Um, I'm biased. My answer is going to be immediately. Um, there's always going to be that how and why, right? How are we doing things and why are we doing things? And those are from the very, very beginning, sometimes even before you've got your first line of code, right? Deciding which forge to use, right? Am I going to be on GitHub? Am I going to be on GitLab? Am I going to stand up Forge Joe? What, what am I going to do? That's part of governance, frankly. You're making a decision of how and why, and that's going to influence all that sort of stuff. Document that. Um, you know, I think that it should be as early as possible, right? Any triggers uh, for thinking about it? Usually it's when something goes completely sideways, right? That's the thing that, that, that really drives change for all of humanity across all of our endeavors. We'll keep going, going, going until something fails. And we might see that there are problems or we might have our head in the sand and no, we can't see problems. We just got to move forward. And then you hit a tree and all of a sudden you have to admit that you've got problems. So that's typically the trigger when something does go pear-shaped, when you have a dictator for life who is less benevolent, when you get to a situation where people want that representation in the leadership committee and they're not getting it, where you have somebody who is misbehaving and being a real jerk to others, but you don't have a code of conduct. So you can't point and say, look, you were told because they weren't told. That's usually a situation where you then have to backfill and go, okay, this would not have been as big of a problem if we had done this. So. Let's pivot, let's shift, let's evolve. And it is, like I said, you're always going to be doing this. You're constantly going to be evolving. But constantly evolving human infrastructure makes sense because we as individuals, we're constantly changing and growing and evolving and learning more. And projects are similar in that way. Human beings 
make up open source, open source of people. And if open source is people and people are constantly learning and growing, your project similarly should constantly learn and grow. Um, we have a question from Tilo. Hi, Tilo. Um, thanks for the presentation and sharing this great resource. You're welcome. Um, what typical mistake in the governance approach do you most frequently see when I'm working with for-profit organizations? Um, typical mistake uh, with for-profit organizations. Oh, I don't know if there's only one. Um, I mean, I'm writing a 400 page book right now that covers the typical mistakes of uh, for profit organizations working with open source. Um, a common one lately, which is not typical, but it is unfortunately common, are uh, open source projects released by open core pro uh, companies that don't understand what it means to be open source or what it means to run a company, frankly. Um, you, open source is not a business model. And so creating something and releasing it under a permissive or heck even reciprocal license, um, and then getting your knickers in a twist when somebody who is a competitor grabs that and creates a more compelling product offering, um, that's not the fault of it being an open source project. That's the fault of the company not understanding how business models work and how to make money and how to run a mis business. So that's really common. That's a, a common governance mistake. Um, typically, those situations coincide with a company that has a death grip on the project and doesn't understand the power, the just absolute magnitude of the power of community and free and open source software. And they've got this project in a death grip and they are using it to, you know, they're driving it around like a, like a clown car or something, um, rather than allowing community contribution, community uh, input, anything like that, because they're afraid. Right? They don't know how open source works. They don't know how to collaborate externally. They don't know how coopetition can function. Um, and so they do business as usual. And what they know is proprietary software, which is we have this and it's, you know, we control it. Um, and that's a big problem. They don't understand the power of open governance. Um, Often there's nothing you can do about that. They release it under an open source license and that's fine. Anyone can still use it, but from a business perspective, they're really missing out on the big picture and a lot of very powerful strategic moves that they can make their, uh, they can use to move their company forward and to make it more money and to get it ahead of its competitors while also making the world a better place. There's a lot of money in making the world a better place and not simply going for the bottom line. Um, I'm not sure whether that answered your question, Tilo. It was kind of rambling, but uh, hopefully that's helpful. That was insightful. Oh, thank you. Um, all right, uh, do you have another one for me, Wilma? Uh, I have one last one and that is, how can good governance be introduced or promoted as a benefit, especially when working with granting or funding organizations? So if you're applying for a grant, you can actually, you know, tout that as, as a benefit of your project. Oh, how can good governance be used as a benefit, as a differentiator is what we would say in the business world. Um, it's, wow, this, it's the sort of thing that kind of sells itself, right? When, when you're going for a grant, um, what they really want to see is not only that you're going to make a difference, but frankly, that their money is going to be spent well. Um, Frank, to be totally honest, it's that you've got your shit together, right? They're more likely to give money to the organization that's able to say, here's our governance documents, here's our charter, here's how we elect people, here's how we build our roadmap, here's how we run our program. Um, we have read Ben Cotton's book and we follow it to the letter, here's how you do it. Um, 
they're more likely to give money to an organization that's able to do that and show that they have thought through that human infrastructure that is more likely to lead them to success in their research. And that success may be finding that, you know, your hypothesis doesn't work at all, which is great, but it's still success, right? They're going to give it to you rather than that schmuck over there who just says, yeah, we're going to collect data and, and yes, we're required to, so we'll open our stuff under, I don't know, maybe the MIT license. That person doesn't have their shit together. You do. Just by being able to say, we have thought this through in advance. We have an idea of where we are going to start with the governance for our open source project. Who's going to join it, how we are all going to collaborate, how we are going to run our human infrastructure. I think that kind of sells itself as far as uh, grant writers are concerned. Obviously, they're going to have their own um, criteria and you should always follow the steps and the criteria of the grant for which you are applying. Um, but being able to show them that you've thought through the human infrastructure side of it, that makes, that does a lot to build confidence in your research project. Okay. Well, thank you so much. This was a great presentation and um, very insightful take on, on how governance is, you know, an open source is about the people. Um, so, you know, I think we've probably all gathered some tidbits to take away from today. Um, and uh, again, thank you for joining us for today. And um, thanks to uh, Patrick and uh, Kathy for helping organize the session and get all the, the infrastructure lined up uh, for us to continue these um, micro conferences. So thanks everyone and um, have a great rest of your day. Bye all.